There are people who will uptrain beta. Barry Sturman has uptrained beta. Uh, Joel Lubar has used it. Uh, Margaret Ayers has uptrained beta. You have to use caution when you uptrain beta for a couple reasons. Uh, one is that you are generally telling some part of the brain to activate, but you're not telling some other part of the brain not to. So uh, this is what would have been happening with this, this poor woman who was uptraining her son's beta. Um, it's almost like you got a, it's almost like poking a tiger with a hot prod. Um, you don't know if he's going to turn around and bite your hand off, run out the door, uh, attack your kids, whatever. There's too much going on when you try and uptrain an excitation rhythm without shaping it. But people who do uptrain beta, uh, Julian Isaacs, for example, is one of the early ones, they report sometimes an aha experience, a brightening when it's used. Uh, but I would be very, very cautious. I would use it in an adult who does not indicate that they're prone to anxiety or that they're prone to mood problems. Uh, you might use it in an adult who needs or wants sharpening, wants to be a little more uh, elevated. Another way to get at it is to downtrain the low frequencies, and that's actually a more stable way to get at it because of the concentration relaxation cycle. If I downtrain a low frequency, the brain is naturally going to shift to a high frequency, and that's an important aspect of practical training. Yes. Yes. Correct. Right. Now that's a very good Select point. Variance. Yeah, Mike made the very good point. Kurt Thornton, for example, trains a beta connectivity measure, and he actually trains what's called spectral correlation. But he looks at kids, and he works with kids with problem populations, and um, you know various. Again, I don't like throwing out the, the pigeonholes, uh, but Kurtley trains using two channels, and he trains the beta to have a similar spectral shape. So the high frequency activity is similar between the two sites. So he's not so much worried about the amplitude as he is worried about the relationship between two sites. And Kurt will often be, be staying even on one hemisphere. And, and go, you know, for example, something like T3 to P3 or even CZ to P3, that kind of a thing. <coughs> Teaching the brain to coordinate those sites, either more or less, the amount of connectivity. So it's a little more like a, someone who adjusts your body. Uh, you could go to a, yes? Thornton, T-H-O-R-N-T-O-N, Kurtley Thornton, he's in New Jersey. Um, we're actually uh, doing some, in, some work with him to um, ensure that our instruments do what he's looking for. We understand that metric and we're within a couple percent of his metric actually in most cases. But he's very, very good, very experienced. And he has a normative database of that beta connectivity metric. Incidentally, it's an interesting historical and current issue. Kurtley has developed norms using the lexicor equipment for what he wants to see in terms of this spectral correlation coefficient across all the frequency ranges. He trains not only beta, he trains high beta and what we call gamma in these kids. And the struggle he now has is that because he's created a normative database and clinical procedures all wrapped around it, uh, he needs instruments which have consistent measurements. He needs to measure the same thing. And he doesn't measure coherence, he measures what's called spectral correlation, SCC. And in our, con in our connectivity talk, we go into detail on that and show the data and such. But it's a really important point. What's more important than the amplitude, as Mike pointed out, or the amount of excitation, is the amount of relative excitation, how two sites in the brain relate to one another. So I don't care so much how much beta it's making. What I care is how much beta is it making compared to this other part of the brain. Are they appropriate? So, you know, there's a lot of analogies I could use, but it's kind of like matching your dancing partners. You know, if I'm, if I'm choreographing a ballet, I, you know, as you very may or may know, a lot of dancers are very tall. Uh, it, I don't care how tall or short you are. Uh, I, Nureyev was a short little guy. What you worry about is are they matched? Can they go up and down together? as appropriate. Because I think also a lot of people, you know, like Joel and sure. people you mentioned, uh, even, you know, people like Corey Hammett said, well, the literature says 
beta is this good thing. It's right. It's associated with attentiveness. And then all of a sudden, you know, your, your client's grinding their teeth. And yeah, good point. My, it's Mike, not a manageable thing. Yeah, Mike has pointed out a, a uh, 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 one of the, I don't want to call it a blind alley, but there are practitioners who, who interpret the literature and they say, oh, beta's good. Beta means you're processing information. Beta means you're alert. You know, beta means you're happy, whatever. And then they go ahead and just start training the amplitudes. And then, as Mike says, people are grinding their teeth and uh, irritable and irritated and such. Um, we have to be very, very careful. Uh, and I like to use physical analogies and such, you know, and it's like confusing muscle for fat, you know. Big isn't better and small isn't, I mean, you could be so skinny that you're unhealthy and you could be, you know, what you want is right. <laughs> what you want is, is appropriate and flexible. The, the enlightened use of these assessment tools and using them with clinical guidance and with an understanding of brain physiology is what's going to help you do effective protocols and not send people off sideways. Talk briefly about high beta. Again, typically 20 to 30. Um, people use all sorts of ranges for that. I've seen people go to 35. Um, Thatcher even talks about gamma. To him, the high, the high range of this is, is, is called gamma in NeuroGuide. Um, high beta is, first of all, I'll, I'll caution you, muscle can sneak up in there. EMG can be very prevalent up in there. Uh, the only way to really tell it apart is by looking at the waves. Margaret Ayers actually will blow the EEG up to a full screen, and she'll take a whole second and stretch it out, and she can see the difference between high beta and muscle activity. Because muscle activity looks more like a droning frequency, like your Porsche out in the driveway humming along, whereas true beta has more of a waxing and waning uh, sinusoidal shape. So a lot of this is morphology, not just frequency. Um, I, I could have emphasized way at the beginning. The frequency bands are just a way of looking at it. It's like looking at each and every one of you by your height and weight. I ignore so much about you if all I know is your height and weight. Well, if I'm a physical fitness trainer, maybe height and weight is all I really need to use to get started with. But, um, and with EEG, the frequencies are what we start with. They're an important aspect. But, but we don't want to ignore the morphology, the origin, the behavior. What are the clinical signs? So high beta, when it is EEG, is associated again with thinking, intensive thinking. It tends to be associated with ruminating thoughts or stewing, uh, worrying about things, you know, doing a hard math problem, mental effort, if you will. But again, it really only reflects that during its waxing and waning when it's appearing in a certain place. Um, People typically put a guard band on high beta. When we train with most protocols, it's very common to put what we call a stop or an inhibit on high beta. Same time we put one on theta. We inhibit those highs and lows. The main reason is to eliminate artifact. Uh, but an important factor is we put a stop band on there because if we didn't, if a person had muscle tension, teeth grinding, you know, squinching up your forehead, squinching up your jaw, some of that information is going to leak down into an alpha or low beta. The filters will still respond. So in the old days, in the 60s, when we had alpha trainers and they didn't have guard bands, you could hook yourself up to an alpha machine, start grinding your teeth and making alpha. And it would beep and reward you and you'd make yourself into a nervous wreck. This, that set the field back 20 years because there were no consistent results. Well, it wasn't just a 60s thing, because how many, how many times do you find uh, clinics where they just sort of set the protocol and leave the room, right. and the kid learns that by Some kids learn that. creating certain artifacts, yes. they, they get the reward. Yes, you know? that's a very good point, that in, in, in cases, I mean, sometimes even if you have these guard bands, Mike pointed out, if you leave the room and just let the kid roar, these kids will learn. You know, maybe there's a kind of a little, yeah, though, whatever they can, um, you didn't tell them they're supposed to relax, sit still, be quiet, pay attention, allow the sounds to come, don't move. You just tell them, make the bell ring. And by George, they'll figure out some way or another to make the bell ring. All these uh, interesting things to avoid.